Hello and welcome to the Crichton Crowbar. It's episode 118, it's November 10th. I'm Graham Smith and I'm joined in the podding studio by two other people. One of them is a glass in his mouth. Marsh Davis. And the other one is... Chris Thurston. Don't know where his glass is. It's down here. Yeah. What's the news, Chris? The news is probably... Well, Fallout's out today, so that's news for people. Legacy of the Void is out today, so that's news for people. But the news of the weekend was um, Blizzard Convention, or BlizzCon, as it's called by the kids, uh, where I was. Activision Blizzard Conference, Uh, I believe is its full name. Yeah, the the former leave of Vendy Activision Blizzard (laughs) Conference (laughs) um, in Los Angeles. Uh, Yeah, where I went, and it was one of those things where they didn't really announce anything... I, don't really, I think they announced anything like you know, like a big name thing. There were no like big new logos to flash up or anything else. But it was like the one where they provide all the details on the things that they announced last year. So um, we saw the Warcraft movie trailer. Have you guys seen that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think? Ah, uh, he looks alright. He looks a bit, <laughs> a little, little, bit, little bit characterless and plasticky CG. I like the man from Vikings. He's very charismatic. Mm. Somebody said it uh, looks a little bit like the Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's a bit of that vibe. I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, interestingly, because I said this in the last pod, that I thought the, the reaction in that, room, in that room would be amazing. Um, and it, it was a big, it got a big cheer, right? Like that, that, you know, trailer was a big deal for people. They brought it on fairly early in the opening thing. It wasn't like the end thing they closed on or anything. They had, they had Duncan Jones and some of the actors on stage. Mm. Um, but it got a, a, a less excited response than the cgi intro for the new world of warcraft expansion right. which i think kind of shows where that audience's huh. priorities or interests maybe skew because the 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 intro to world of warcraft legion which is next year's expansion is just fan service to the nth degree it's you know and it's the end of that story that um like warcraft nerds have been waiting to see ended since the end of warcraft 3 the game so you know it's this big thing and there's a helicarrier with a magic zombie on it <laughs> and it crashes into a different helicopter carrier with a magic man on it and then everyone falls in the sea it's great uh, but it was interesting that like the warcraft thing which is, almost feels like a curiosity to its own audience in a way in, in that event that's so kind mm. of insular and, and there are plenty of people there who only play blizzard games and that's their entire universe but even so the movie felt like it was just outside enough of the, that universe to to not even be like a, a main event in the way that a World of Warcraft expansion is, which puts some things in context, I think. There's so much suspicion around game to movie adaptations, and the assumption being that this isn't going to be for us as much as the MMO expansion is for us. This is going to be for your Lord of the Rings fans mm. a little bit as well, which is fair. Do you see that? I mean, just briefly, Derrick, you see that Activision also announced that they're working on. Not just a Call of Duty movie, but a Call of Duty universe of movies, like a cinematic universe in the same way as there's a Marvel cinematic universe, but for Call of Duty. So you're going to have, I guess, time travelling Captain Price casual. fighting yeah. um, when World War Two and present day and future and Soap McTavish and all them, all them lovely characters you love from the games you love. Sort of repeat that <laughs> <laughs> noise that we just made. Uh, yeah. Better news from BlizzCon? Better news from BlizzCon. Um, there's lots of little things, but the big thing, and the thing that the internet is ultimately very happy or angry about in the manner of <laughs> Ralph Wiggum, is the uh, the Overwatch kind of coalesced as a, as a thing, as a business thing that people understand now. It's been very fuzzy. Everyone assumed it was going to be free to play because it's colourful and it's multiplayer and it has characters with names that look like you might be able to buy them. Um, and it's not at all. It's a full price boxed game. If you buy it in a box, you have to. You can leave the box and buy it on the internet. I hear, <laughs> but you know, it's a. It, they're releasing a game. It's a Blizzard game, and it's going to have collector's editions and all the rest of that stuff. And it comes with all of the characters, twenty-one characters. And uh-huh. over the course of the event, uh, people were asking the same question over and over again, which is like, "What do you do after launch? What will you sell? You know, you get skins in the collector's edition, which suggests that." They'll sell cosmetics, that kind of thing, and they were cagey about it, and and then got less and less cagey about it until I think I think I think I don't think, I think this was a chance really and a bit of luck, but in an interview with PC Gamer, um, they finally gave the clearest answer they've given, and it was almost like a process of erosion. It just happened to be that on our watch was when the I don't know the coastal hotel fell in the sea. Um, <laughs> 
by which I mean they said <laughs> that they really don't have any plans to sell Heroes after release and so on, that, mm. you know, it actually should be conceived of as a single boxed product that has the stuff in the box and there might be cosmetics and things, but mm. at the moment the focus is on that. And don't that build set. on limestone or chalk. Yeah, indeed, especially in Cornwall. Um I've totally thrown myself. <laughs> but, um, and that that was a big deal, I think, because, well, I mean, the internet seems to be outraged that it's not free to play, which, if you, in case you were wondering whether or not we were in an inversion <laughs> of five years ago, there's your proof um, that everything's backwards now, because that's, that that's how that works. Um, but for me, um, this and the other thing has contributed to what will now inevitably become the incredible, tiresome Chris's weekly U-turn on Overwatch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so having fallen in love with it and then burnt out on it, and then gone to BlizzCon, and now like it again. And this isn't because, um, like, they, you know, the, of the brain worm they feed you <laughs> in the first day when you're there. It did help. S surround you with happy people cosplaying the characters from the game and yeah. stuff like that until oh, man, you it's, catch their joy. It's, it, I mean, I, I, spent, I spent very little time on the show floor because I didn't have time, so it, there wasn't time for me to catch that infectious, you know, fan thing. Um, I did wander past the, the merchandise thing and, and, like, briefly, momentarily consider buying a $150 statue of Tracer from Overwatch, <laughs> which I then didn't do because it was like, no, like slapping myself. Um, and this year I got much less close to resubscribing to World of Warcraft than I did the last time I went. So I think I am gaining a resistance to BlizzCon over time. <laughs> That's irrelevant. Um, but so two things that really helped fix Overwatch. I think one of them... And one of them might just be me simply being slightly wrong about some things about how that game fits together. Um, but the other thing is, and this this sort of changes it. I was perceiving the game as this thing that would be expanded forever. That the the way they were kind of designing the support characters, for example, which I've spoken about before, was sort of like almost like a template for the future, like a paradigm, like it would be in Dota or Heroes of the Storm, hmm. rather than simply like like the the kind of fixed pieces of a closed system which is what the game actually is and um when you factor that in with the three characters they revealed at blizzcon which are the final three it actually the game feels finished now in a way that it doesn't in the beta and a lot of the things that i was interpreting as like sort of like system-wide balance and pacing and rhythm problems were actually just as far as i can tell like temporary weaknesses in the absence of the remaining parts of that balance puzzle hmm. um because uh, so the best example that so all three of the new characters counter in some way the characters that are the most overused and most bullshit and attract the most over you know the pack out rosters in the beta as it stood until today when they've added those characters in hmm. and you know someone asked like well how come you know all three of them share this they're all interesting counters to that stuff. And um, it was like just coincidence. Apparently, these are the characters that they were working on last. I don't really know. Yeah. If that's just, I, think, on, I mean, they would be mad if they did, weren't reactive in the way that they designed the characters. But these design, like the I game. talked to them. They, these these characters take seventeen weeks to build. This isn't reactive. Like this is. Oh, I'm sure they they had those characters in mind, but they must have they must have tweaked them surely to, to maybe. Be... But, I, but what I'm what I'm the way I now see it is that if you removed any three characters from the game, you'd create the problem that previously existed. Huh, if right. you see what I mean. Yeah. yeah. So like because it's, it's a, bit, a bit like with TF2, if you removed two classes from TF2 to kind of make proportionally the same impact mm. you'd go hang on there's something missing and then you'd go oh this is what the game needed to not kind of you know so basically everything has checks and balances and because these three specific characters were missing characters like bastion who turns into a turret and a Widowmaker who's a sniper mm. um, um all had, had a freer reign than other characters did whose checks and balances were in the game already if that makes sense mm. so um and they're dead cool. They're just, and I'll, I'll explain the moment I fell in love with Overwatch again, uh, but very briefly by explaining one of them, uh, who's my favorite in the ones, whose name is Diva, and she's a Korean StarCraft player in a mech. And she, StarCraft actually exists in the Overwatch universe, and she's like a future WCS champion who becomes a mech pilot to protect her homeland from a giant robot that comes out of the sea. Um, which, yeah, is, and she was, she's in this bubblegum pink mech, uh, which has the most you know brilliant kind of like robocop style ui when you're in it little details like if there's a diva on the other team whenever she comes into view the mech starts auto targeting her because it can detect that that's a mech and it looks completely different to targeting any other enemy overwatch is full of little details like that hmm. um when you get into the mech it kind of boots up with this big kit uh, big rabbit icon which is her like starcraft pro player icon and stuff and it's sort of implied that she's streaming to twitch the entire time um so it's, it's a really cool design but the way she uh, but she's actually um like a tank and there are other tanks in the game, like Reinhardt, who puts a big shield up in front of him. People can march behind him. 
and Zarya who puts bubble shields on people. Diva's thing is she creates a field. She can she can deactivate her guns to create like this field of like like traced out by lasers in front of her, and any projectile that enters that field gets shot down by the mech. So she can kind of create this field around her allies or in front of herself in a cone that basically just completely nullifies incoming bullets for as long as she keeps it up. She can't fire when she's doing it, but she can kind of um, actually destroy enemy projectiles rather than simply block them. And so that means that she can walk at a Bastion, for example, or a Farah, who's sort of jetpacking rocket lady, when she's using her ult and just sort of like shoot all the rockets out of the sky and looks fucking rad. Um, and she has these big double chain guns. Her ult, when she's in the mech, ejects her from the mech, and then the mech detonates in this massive explosion, and so on. But the thing that's just fucking rad that took me a little while to get really used to is she can fly, because the mech has jump jets, and you activate them, and you just fly in any direction you want for a short duration. So she's way more mobile than like any other big tank character in the game when she's in the mech. And you can fly up to rooftops and stuff. And this came to a head for me in a way that I was like... Because at the moment, Reinhardt, who fulfills a similar role, big knight with a hammer and a, 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 like a force field shield... Um, field mandatory in the game at the moment and you know most teams on, on offense particularly will just march behind Reinhardt forever and Diva prefers an alternative to this and I was playing her on defense on a map where the attackers run out of a church like it's called Dorado but it's kind of South American themed and to the front of the church is like this village and then to the right there's this cliff top that leads down to the sea and um, I was basically like keeping them in the door by just firing my chain guns, which you can fire forever, just in the doorway. And I got into this sort of like back and forth with a Reinhardt, who doesn't have a ranged attack, but he would come marching out with the shield and try and get close to me, and I would back off and just unload these chain guns at him. And then his only ranged thing is this like fireball he can throw out with his hammer. And he'd throw that out, and it'd hit me, because I can't actually destroy it with the with the deflection grid. Um, but I would take it, and then I would keep shooting him. And I worked with him where I destroyed his shield. And I was just trying to bait him into charging because Reinhardt has the thing where he can charge at somebody and he loses all control because the rockets on his back activate and he has to hit something eventually. But if he hits somebody, he'll pin them to a wall and almost certainly kill them instantly. Um, I was trying to bait him into charging, just waiting and inching left and right and baiting and baiting and baiting. Eventually, I see he's going to do it because he's trying to line it up. And then he charges and I just point myself upwards and fire the rocket jets and just <laughs> fly upwards a little bit. At which point he fly, shoots straight past me and I spin around in time to see him just vanish off the edge of the map and just fly <laughs> into the sea. <laughs> and it was like, because it, I've seen Reinhardt's run off the edge of the map before, but because I kind of planned it and it required on the little reveal of those rocket boosters, hmm. it was just one of those like, yeah, this is fucking good. <laughs> Ole! <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I, and, you know, the, oh, basically that's all I'll say about Overwatch Pop. And to explain why I'm kind of back on it is... Uh, those characters, Genji and Mei is fucking amazing. I don't probably rant about her even more, but um, little Chinese lady who freezes people. Um, um, they they feel like they, they, the game is a lot fresher with them in it. A lot of the things that feel bullshit are gone with them in it. And they highlight the thing that Overwatch I think is actually about is those moments where it's kind of TF2 or enemy territory, but when two characters are fighting, it feels more like a comic book fight between superheroes because mm-hmm. of the amount of different powers and movement abilities that you have. Do you still I think it's got good. lasting power, though? I mean, you know, all these games coming out now, they all have just an endless treadmill of updates and additions to the games. And I don't know if... And does Overwatch have that kind of purity of design which will allow it to sustain a community forever like, like Counter-Strike does? Maybe. I don't know. I think that's to be proven. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel more confident in it now than I did. I think it's... Uh, I'll get on this later. Um, but the it's interesting playing Legacy of the Void because that is the you know, same price point. It's a full price product. Hmm. And the amount of stuff in that game is fucking enormous. Like, this is, without making any qualitative statement about any of it, that is like a kind of world-class eSport, with a, which also has co-op, a whole co-op thing. And it has co- co-op multiplayer things that are new. And it has a, you know, 20-hour campaign. And it's a massive box of stuff. And, it, you know, it's a reminder of that old Blizzard era of, like, hmm. just a really massive box of high-quality stuff that you only get once every five years. Or whatever. Which they'll still be patching 10 years from now. Isn't yeah, they? exactly. They've always been really good at. Whereas Overwatch, I don't think, I mean, you know, the, the scale of it now would be bigger than a lot of full price games that are just multiplayer, right? Like, there's no, by the standards of the industry, it's absolutely, you know, validates being the price point it is by standards of what other companies do. Hmm. But it's interesting that it's like Blizzard don't usually do that. They don't usually release a full price thing that's just one aspect of a game, right? Like, for it to fit the StarCraft model, it would also have a full single-player campaign and a billion other things, mm. and some kind of, you know, you know, co-op mode or something else, and a map editor and, you know, a custom game lobby and, you know, 
a global tournament. Mm. So that's interesting, but that's that, that's that's just all to be decided. Basically, I like Overwatch again now, and uh, I just want to be a Korean idol in a bubblegum pink mech forever. That's how I've always thought of you, yeah. Chris. Me too. What have you been playing, Marty? I've been playing, as you well know, because I wrote about it for you, um, Cryptoc. Cryptoc. Which is a roguelike shmup set in uh, a number of decrepit, derelict space hulks of alien origin, which you are dismantling the security systems systems of so that you can send in your salvage crew to go and strip them for parts with the eventual aim of reaching the crypt arc itself which is apparently some kind of you know epic mother bonanza of alien goodies <laughs> you mother bonanza <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's in early access and it is i it was such a delight to play it last week because i do early access reviews every week and you know, I, we've talked about the fame of early access a lot of the time. It's not that often the games I play on early access are are bad games or are going to be bad games. It's just that they aren't much of anything yet, and it's hard to tell where they're going to end up. Like, it feels like early access is this weird kind of inverse junkyard where games begin their lives rather than end them. <laughs> and, you know, you look at these games and you're like, well, yeah, you know, maybe if you... Get some brake pedals and a steering column and some doors and wheels. One day you may be a Renault Five, and then <laughs> and, and then Cryptoc turns up and it's just like, oh, it's it's a fully working Bentley. They just haven't decided what colour the indicator lights are going to be yet. And congratulations on the second most confused metaphor <laughs> in this pod so far. Yeah, um, and it's 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 great. And a road like shmup wouldn't usually do it for me like if i i I like some roguelike shmups but just as a concept they they always feel a bit trivial to me and i don't have the endless hours to grind my way through a rogue roguelike and be forgiving of the loss of progress that is inherent in the kind of roguelike concept a lot of the time but this uh really does uh sort out a lot of those problems by just making every level of play that you engage with to be really interesting and interconnected with all other levels of play. And what I mean by that is not only is it a a really kind of exciting shmup second to second with lots of kind of mobility tools that you can use and a huge variety of extremely varied weapons, and the enemies that you're fighting are also extremely varied and have very distinct attack patterns and tactics that are required to kind of um, negate them. But... All of that is wrapped up in a a larger strategy about how you approach each hulk. These are procedurally generated spaces. Um, Although you are presented kind of with some kind of sense of what is vertical, you have freedom of movement within it. You've got jetpacks on this gun suit that you're piloting, so you can fly up and down without any any kind of problem. There's no gravity in there. It's in the vacuum. And you can go straight for this brain, which is the core of each ship. Once you destroy the brain, then the ship is yours it's fine. Everything's fine. You, um, but that core is usually protected by a large number of other security systems of varying, um, uh, varying styles and varying. They each one act, acts like a mini boss, and they have kind of different ways that you have to destroy them. So this, the mother brain might be protected by a shield system, a shield generator elsewhere in the ship, and this has like these spinning. Uh, broccoli, I call them in the review. I don't know what they are, but they kind of rotate around this thing which you've got to shoot at, but you've got to dodge the, the shields as they're rotating. and So that, that requires a bit of skill. It's not like it's not so involved that it would become boring each time you face it, but it's it's engaging and interesting enough to change up your, your, the, the way that you act on the map and whether you find a particular task difficult or not and what kind of equipment you have to meet those tasks changes the way that you move through each hulk. So an, another thing that is an absolute fucker is the the, um, the repair system, which uh, if you have two of them, for example, and they are separated by a locked door, which is controlled by the locked door system, it's 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 almost an insoluble... Insoluble problem? Can you say insoluble problem? I, I, I don't know. Can you dissolve it? <laughs> hmm. Don't know. Anyway, <laughs> uh, because obviously if you destroy the door locking system to get from one repair thing to another then it's going to get repaired pretty promptly. And if you destroy one repair thing, you've still got to then go and destroy the door locking system before the repair thing. Anyway, basically you have to prioritize your 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 progress through this thing. 
Um, and uh, for, an, an, another example, so the progress system, which I forgot to talk about just then, even though I've already started talking about it because I'm an idiot, is uh, this thing which spews out hundreds and hundreds of drones. And you can easily destroy the drones, but while you're destroying the drones, it's dividing your attention from the thing you need to shoot to get the actual system's core health down. And as, as it's doing that, it's constantly replenishing its health. So it just sops up loads and loads and loads of ammunition. So if you're having, if you, you really need to kill it super fucking quick, basically. But certain weapons would be better for that job than others. And, you know, it, when you go to, uh, when you pick which Hulk you're going to go to, you get a list of all the different security systems, all, all the different AI drones that are available. And you can really kind of strategize about how, you, how you're going to pick your path through this thing, which systems you're going to knock out, which ones you're going to risk staying up just so you can get to the core in time, because there is a time limit on it. And after you hit that time limit, the amount of money that you get back from this uh, exercise is vastly reduced. And that's important because there is an extra level of strategy to it, which is that this each ship takes part, is part of an ongoing campaign to reach the crypt arc, and you only have a limited budget to do that entire thing. There's like six, six hops, I guess, six like different stages of difficulty before you reach the crypt arc. Each hop, you go to a new area of space and there's like five different ships around you of varying difficulty in various specs, which you can choose one from. If you successfully complete it, you go to the next level of difficulty. It's really harsh because it's escalating difficulty based on your success. And even if you scraped through, you don't get time to kind of pick up resources and turtle and kind of amass, mm. you know, uh, strength. You're just fucking bum rushed onto the next thing. And... Because of that, if you if you lose if you fuck up one single Hulk, um, you don't get reimbursed for the amount of resources you spent on that mission, um, and your budget is cut down by probably about a fifth. So there's a really and that means not not only is it I mean if you keep on failing as I, I always do because I think the difficulty in the game is maybe set a little too high at the moment then you, your, your life ends there. You, you hit, hit the red for your budget and it's game over. And you have to go right back to the start. But even if you do successfully um, repeat uh, a difficulty level because you failed once and it just moves you on to a different set of ships of equivalent difficulty, even if you complete that, you may have sown the seeds of your eventual failure because you will not, you know, at later difficulty stages, you may not be able to complete those missions with the budget at your disposal. So... Every second of that game, you're not just thinking about your moment-to-moment -moment movements and how you counter the actual enemies that are coming towards you, um, which is exciting to do anyway. But you're also thinking about how that action fits into your general, your grander purpose within that single Hulk and how that, what you need to do within that Hulk in order to ensure the success of your overall mission, maybe six or seven missions down the line. And I don't know... I don't see that many games which have thought quite so hard about how each bit of their game relates to the other bits of their game. And it's a really beautiful and elegant piece of design. I think, you know, universities who do these, you know, teach game courses could easily look at Cryptarch and give it to students and say, these people have taken what is probably one of the simplest uh, ideas for a game, which is the shmup, you know, enemies come at you, you shoot them and has made it into something really strategically deep. And how did they do that? And un unpick that is, is probably a good learning exercise. Sounds quite a lot like Invisible Ink in that regard, which also mm. has that macro level. You know, the success and failure is quite granular based on not the current mission, but the next one and how, mm. how, how screwed you can be by a successful but inefficient performance. Do you get into these situations where you are screwed, but you don't realise it, and you just find out five missions later? Well, yeah. I've not got to the point where I'm not ever screwed yet. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I'm not, I've never completed it. Uh, I don't really get past difficulty four, five, I don't think. No, I've, ne I've never got past difficulty five, um, which is lame. I'm not very good at this game, is basically what I'm saying. But uh, yes, yes, you can easily get into situations which I think... And I, I'm, I'm reticent to say that some hulks that are generated are completely unwinnable, hmm. but it, they do seem pretty difficult. Like if you've got two repair systems, both of which will repair each other remotely. 
Um, oh. And they're also going to re- repair any other system that you knock down. And maybe they're gated by a locked door system, as I was saying earlier. Maybe they've got shields on them. Who knows? <laughs> you know, there's just... A, you're you're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Somebody else can do that for me, and I can watch it on YouTube. I don't mind like being boned in that way if it's a, an immediate boning, but when it's that kind of <laughs> um, economic boning, where I am long term economic I'm, boning, yeah, where I'm, <laughs> I'm boned now, but I don't know it yet. I'm just going to find out at, in twenty minutes, which kind of renders that extra twenty mm. minutes moot. It, it was a, feels like a waste of time in retrospect now. Cause well, I think maybe that's that's the element of the uh, indicator lights color being chosen before it falls off the cliff in Cornwall um, <laughs> like that's that's I mean that's why it's in early access not because of any other level of incompletion of the game but because those things probably need to be ironed out there's some there's a few bugs in it like pathfinding still uh, finds you you can kind of you, you go to a map screen you can click anywhere on the map it draws you a path to it but it'll draw paths through locked doors which you don't necessarily have ways of opening so there's there's kind of little things like that that are still left to do and i think balancing is probably the, the major issue and yeah i agree i think just just kind of uh expiring because your cash reserves are a penny short just before you get to the crypt arc would be super super fucking irritating but i kind of think that it's digital enough um and because your progress is accelerated so much you fail pretty quickly Mm, okay. um, and so um, there were people in the R- RPS comments saying that they wish it wasn't a roguelike that they they would be allowed to take their time over this stuff and I, I see that I do see the attraction of that but I also see that, that the pressure uh, uh, and the stress of that game probably is what they're going for and it probably makes it a better game in some ways I guess the fix is rather than only punishing you for taking too long you reward you for doing it extra quick so if you if you screw up and you take mm. too long and you get too small a reward and you think that you're going to run out of money in three arcs time or whatever um then it just incentivizes you to say fuck it on the next run i'm going to go straight for the brain and ignore everything else because if i get this done in the first two minutes then i make up for my losses on the last one and then yeah. that maybe pushes you towards a hard failure state or this kind of really dramatic success because you you do it the hard way and you catch up with where you ought to have been and are back on track, something like that. Yeah, you have fixed the game. There you go. There we go. <laughs> I haven't played it, but that's what I do. I also like learning from your article the etymology of crypt and arc. Oh yeah, yeah. very interesting. Always Read the old tags. Text. Yeah. <laughs> Is crypt arc actually a word outside no. of that context? Because it's also in Destiny. So just oh. if it's a neological. <laughs> Uh, maybe I don't think it's a word. I assume because it's an arc is in a spaceship, mm. and it's a crypt because all the people on it are dead now. Um, yeah, yeah. In Destiny, so, it's crypt arc with A R C H, oh, which and is it's different. crypt as in cryptological, as in you know code. Oh, but it to. means right. It doesn't mean something else. Like they're taking arc as an archon. Mm. Maybe I don't know. I'd, if it is a word, it's a kind of dumb word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What have you been playing, Graham? I've been playing Football Manager 2016 edition, the favourite game for people to talk about on the podcast. I love football, Graham. Yes, you do. And football management. I, uh, it was, it's like, was that a comma in between football and Graham then? Or is, <laughs> or is football Graham the person we bring on to talk about football manager? Because I think it's the latter. I like both of those things. I love football, Graham. <laughs> I like Football Ground too. <laughs> so the Football Manager 2016 beta has been available for a couple of weeks. The game's out Friday, the same day as this podcast is. Um, and I've, but I've been mucking around with the, the version you anyone gets access to just by pre-ordering it. Um, and it's broadly the same as Football Manager always is. But the problem I've been having is it's always hard to start a new Football Manager career. It feels a little bit like sitting down to read a novel you know is going to take you all year to read. You, some, some, you're trying to decide, like, what team am I going to manage? What kind of story am I going to tell myself? And there's, it's trying to find a balance between stories that you know too well, so teams that you know all the players or you, you played that team in the last edition of it, or teams that you don't know at all, like stories that you don't know well enough. So playing a team you've never played before in a league you've never played in before, in which case you lack the kind of emotional connection to it or the context for the little names to mean anything, mm. that sort of stuff. It's a really hard thing to get into a career of football manager, I find. 
and that's you're going to play it probably for 12 months like game takes a long time to get anywhere with because it's simulating so much so much stuff especially if you're playing the full version of the game rather than the classic or what's now called the touch version of the game and so i started a manchester united career and i ditched it immediately and i started a portsmouth career and i ditched it immediately and i was trying to think what to do and so i decided to start a career remain unemployed and go on holiday for 20 years <laughs> and so i'm no longer playing football manager 2016 i'm now playing football manager 2035 <laughs> And the advantages of this are that every actual footballer has retired and every actual manager has retired. And what the game does in that situation is it creates regens. It uh, generates fictional human beings with weird, creepy faces that it's put together using a system it's got for doing that. And and uh, repopulates the world so that you can just keep playing it forever basically you know someone recently on reddit simulated football manager 2015 for a thousand years <laughs> <laughs> and then so in the year 2000 we're like revealing that uh, uh, this is what, what which teams have been relegated since and which teams have been promoted and the, the weird things that have caused the game to break after 600 years and that football sort of stuff. football never changes <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you if you just want to play with fictional players, if you just want to play with regens, you can do that. You can just tick a box and say, give me fictional players, and the whole... Um, hmm. It will still start in the year 2016, 2015, rather. Um, but everyone will be fictional. But what you don't get then is you don't get the history that you get and the alternate future, rather, that if you actually simulate it. So although all the players, the real players, by 2035 have retired, some of them, for example, have moved into management. They move into staff roles as actual players do. So Wayne Rooney, mm -hmm. who's currently 30 years old and a, a striker for Man United, not a very good one at the moment, he's still in the game, although he's now 50 years old <laughs> because he moved into management the game imagines after his player career and he's managed 12 teams. And so you get this kind of experience now where I'm managing a team in 2035 and I'll, I'll get onto that and playing the game as normal. But you're stumbling across this speculative fiction about football <laughs> as you go along. And that gives it a, a great deal of character, basically. Like it's stories that I know and recognize, but flung into the future and imagined from a new angle. And that's really interesting. So I, I, hmm. I holidayed for 20 years and then decided year, January 1st, 2035, which is halfway through a season, that I would take on my first job. And so I applied for some jobs and, and you do job interviews. You actually sit down with the director of the football club and they ask you questions. And one of the questions they ask me is, um, you, you don't have a, a very good dealings with the press you seem quite bad with the press and i think the reason that they think that i'm bad with the press is that basically i haven't answered my email or any calls in 20 years <laughs> because i've been on holiday for all that time so like it continues to simulate everything and perhaps i think it was still simulating reporters asking me questions of oh, what do you think about this and i just wasn't responding because i wasn't there i had my out of office on for a long long time so now i've got a bad reputation with the press and so in the job interviews i have to promise that uh, you know I, I don't have much experience dealing with the press but when i work for you that will give me the experience i need to get better at it and then once you get the job so i get a job as manager of Leeds United, who in 2035 are in a relegation battle at the bottom of the Premier League. And it's Christmas and they've just sacked our manager because of that. And it's my job to now keep them afloat. I've got six months to do it. But because I've promised the director that I'll do better with the press, that's, he remembers that. And that's now on a screen called Promises. What have you promised to the director of your club? What have you promised to the players that are working for you? And if you break those promises, they, they get cross. So... I join the club, I meet my assistant manager, I meet my backroom staff, I get advice, I talk to players, play a couple of matches, it goes quite well. I win my two for, my first two matches and I move out of the relegation zone. It's looking good. It looks like maybe I can save this club from relegation. That would be a pretty cool little six-month story in the year 2035. And then I get sacked <laughs> after 10 days. I lasted 10 days in the year 2035 as the manager of Leeds United because... It turns out I broke my promise about the press. How? 
I'm not entirely sure. And this is where we get on to qualitative discussions. And it's in beta, so some of the stuff is being patched and will be a little bit better when it comes out on Friday. But some of this stuff has been bullshit for years. And... <laughs> Press dealings have been one of them. It's one of the most common complaints from people who play the game is we don't care about fucking press conferences. And there is a you, lot. You're talking about people who play this game, <laughs> or actual people, people in who football. play football. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> also, actual football managers sometimes complain about that and don't show up for them and stuff. But they have to. They're contractually obligated. Um, but you do a lot of press conferences because. There is a press conference before every Premier League match and there's an interview in the tunnel before the match and there's an interview in the tunnel after the match hmm. and then there's reporters calling you up in the middle of the week and you can give them no comments and stuff like that but maybe that's not so good for your reputation. And the dialogue system where they ask you questions and you can choose whether to answer calmly, passionately, um, <laughs> sternly or My love. one other one. <laughs> um, it doesn't give you enough flexibility to acknowledge the current game state. Like, it doesn't take into account, like, the football manager is tracking an absurd number of variables about everything that's going on. Like, it tracks the weather. It has, like, a system globally for charting weather patterns as they move around the globe. Does so it have climate can, change? So I don't, <laughs> don't know if that does have climate change. Welcome to Aquaball! <laughs> <laughs> But it will keep it will it simulates it like on a global scale so that it makes a kind of sense when it suddenly starts raining on a Sunday in Blackpool. Right. Like it's not just a random <laughs> right. dice roll to decide that. There is a there is a simulation underneath which has a certain accuracy to it. Um but none of that is reflected in the actual conversations that you can have. And so I get I'm in a match against I think Rotherham and the manager of Rotherham talk smack about me in his press conference. It's a little bit WWE is football press conferences. You try and unsettle opposing teams and stuff like that. He says that, you know, I'm never going to make it in management. There's not a chance in hell, etc., etc. I don't I like the experience to make it. Leeds Leeds will see the error of their ways. And I say, oh, you know, I don't I'm not going to raise these bait and I'm I call him childish in the press and says, you know, his comments are ridiculous. Then that seems fine. There's no no comeback to that. Um, game goes on. I do other press conferences. I get asked a question about a player on my team who wants to leave. He's He's been agitating to move on to a different club and he's complained in the press and stuff like that. And I've spoken to him and he's quite happy now because I've told him that I'm going to let him leave the club. And so the journalist question is, you're letting this player leave you know, don't you want him to stay? And I say, no, I don't want any players who are unhappy. That's bad for the team. And he says, well, doesn't giving in to that undermine your authority to other players? And I say, no, I'm, you know, I think I'm making the the decision that's best for the club because there's no point having any unhappy players here. If he doesn't want to go, that's absolutely fine. And that's when I'm called in for the emergency meeting with my director and immediately sacked after 10 days. Now, that conversation where I say, no, I think it's perfectly reasonable to let an unhappy player go. Doesn't seem contentious to me in any way. And I only had two dialogue options, and which was the right or wrong one was completely opaque to me. What it, was the other dialogue option? It was, it was, I can't even remember now. They were both pretty mild. That's the thing. Punch the reporter out. Sometimes you get like six options and four of them will be will be basically, I don't really want to talk about that. Like the huh. the variety and... And options it gives you to say things is is pretty piss poor. I don't think they have a writer <laughs> that actually right. writes these things. Um, and despite endless complaints about it, it doesn't seem like they've put a great amount of detail into it. But it's also just Football Manager prides itself on being a realistic simulation. And so, okay, press dealings are important and managers can get in trouble if they fuck that stuff up. But no club would fire a manager who's just won two games after 10 days because of a bad press conference, let alone a press conference which seemed completely mild, mm. where nothing bad actually happened and perfectly reasonable answers about an innocuous subject were given. Was it kind of like a, you know, one strike and you're out thing because of your 20-year hiatus? 
Well, that, I had no sense of that. I'd mm. made a promise and there was a thing on the promises screen where the, I have to keep that promise for 365 days and then it will expire. So 365 days of, of doing the press well, which I thought I was doing. I thought I was, you know, I kept myself calm <laughs> when I was <laughs> answering the questions and stuff like that. I wasn't too passionate. I didn't call anyone names. I said one of the only two things that I could say. Maybe it was taking into account previous things but I'd only really given two press conferences at that point because I'd only been in position for 10 days and in real life if you were fired after 10 days as a manager like that the team would appear to be in disarray because they've just gone through two managers in 11 days there is a manager's association that would appeal and complain I just won both matches so the fans would be like what the fuck mm. so all of this stuff seems kind of crappy but I'm now back in management. I'm managing Leicester <laughs> in the championship now and still in the year 2035. So instead of in a relegation battle in the premiership, I'm now in a promotion battle in the championship. And it goes on. But I really like playing football manager in the future. Hmm. Can yeah. you bring uh, Ryan Giggs back as a cyborg? He's still in it. He's still, <laughs> still alive? <laughs> Only 35, surely not. He's a... Uh, well, in real life, he's assistant manager of Manchester United, and mm. it's broadly thought that you know he will he will one day be manager of Manchester United, and it's a fairly decent bet because it's Ryan Giggs and he's been in that club for twenty years. But broadly speaking, assistant managers don't move up to become managers of the club that they're at, especially if it's a big club. Assistant managers leave and they become a manager of a much shittier club do well there, mm. prove themselves, and then might come back and become a manager. And so that's all the the game really thinks it doesn't treat Ryan Giggs any differently than it would any other assistant manager. So 20 years in the future, Ryan Giggs is still assistant manager of Manchester United. Aww. And every two years when they sack their manager or their manager quits, Ryan Giggs steps up and is caretaker manager for 12 days until they find a replacement. Back in your and box, then, Giggs. <laughs> and then goes, goes back to being assistant manager again. It's quite, back in your quite cryo, cryo cube, whatever it is, I don't know. Why would it be a cryo cube? <laughs> well, to keep him, you know, keep him youthful. He is, he is pretty pretty useful. Oh, yeah. cryo cube. Yeah, he's a chrome think? cube. Well, actually, it could be chrome. It could be a chrome cryo cube. <laughs> weird kind of Michael yeah. Jackson oxygen tent sort of thing you've got going on. <laughs> I like the idea of somebody uploading Ryan Giggs' psyche to some kind of rasping metal husk that slowly begins to hate itself and call for death. Oh, that can't be that, the birth of AI. AI. <laughs> <laughs> It gives all this stuff gives does give a little bit of um, dwarf fortress feeling to football manager because a dwarf fortress you know you generate a world and then one of mm. the modes is just like the fictional encyclopedia of that world and you can go read about the the orc upri uprisings of nineteen thirty two stuff right. like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> does, so. does anything else happen globally change like do they build new stadia or yeah. Like clubs get bought and taken over and little clubs might get taken yeah, well. over by a giant consortium and suddenly be given hundreds of millions and if the team grows and gets promoted enough times then they'll knock down their stadium and build a new stadium with a new name and yeah. you know, all, all, it simulates a huge amount of stuff. It simulated that in the year 2016 complaints about the 2022 World Cup being hosted in Qatar would cause it to be taken away from Qatar oh, wow. and, and given to China. Which is interesting. Mm, yeah. Like, normally stays away a little bit more from the, that political stuff. I mean, you do want to actually... transfer it to somebody with a really kind of robust human rights record. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Well, I think, the, I think the complaints were about the heat in the summer in Qatar oh. rather than the human rights <laughs> right. abuses. Like I say, again, stays away from the political stuff oh. a little bit. There's not like a set blatter still <laughs> seeing over FIFA 20 years in the future made of money. Hmm. I suppose it would be a perfectly good idea to upload the assistant manager of Manchester United into a computer, but you would need to make space for several gigs of data. Oh! oh. Whoosh. <laughs> Sitting on that one for a little while. <laughs> How many years? <laughs> 20. That's why I've got terrible relations with the press. <laughs> what else have you been playing, Chris? There's something else, I think. So, Blizzard Part 2. Um, today... Uh, it was the day that Legacy of the Void, StarCraft 2, StarCraft 2's third instalment came out. And I've played it for a big chunk of the day. I had to do some other work at some point, but um, brought myself back to it. And it's fucking great. I like StarCraft 2. Um, but more to the point, 
I think it's been a while. I suggested this earlier, but it's been a while since I've played a game that's this sort of like robust and complete and kind of high quality feeling on release. Like it's something that Blizzard got a reputation for doing. And I, I think the same was true of um, Heart of the Swarm. Fuck's sake, that that era is now finally <laughs> over. <laughs> but um, I'm hoping that's the last time I have to say it. But it's got to be on the on the like the end of year lists for this year, surely. Yeah, you know, all, all the hots games. Yeah, for sure. Um, but even you know, and even but even Blizzard's other interim products like things like Hearthstone and Heroes of the Storm mm. and Diablo Three. Um, you know, Reaper of Souls was great, but it was a stopgap on a game that didn't launch great. And um, Hearthstone is really good, but it has problems. And you know, it's been you know people have thrown all sorts of things at it. Uh, Heroes of the Storm I now really really like, but I've had a mixed you know relationship with it, and it's had its ups and downs. It's been a while since Blizzard did what Blizzard do, which is release these kind of fucking flawlessly polished you know big entertainment boxes um i've only played the campaign so far but it's it's great like it takes it feels like a it's it, it's a way of thinking about it today is blizzard have been making this type of rts for about 22 years now and no other game developer that was making a very specific game of type of game in the early 90s and got famous for it is either still making them or still making them absolutely better than anybody with a completely untra- broken track record of getting better at them. Like, imagine if id had never stopped making first-person shooters for any length of time hmm. and had continued to get better at them forever without the kind of the big, you know, the stumble points in, in like, the, the Quake 4s. Was that even id? No, that was Raven. Raven. That was Raven. You, without the kind of the, the shipping it out, like, there's an, maybe in a parallel universe where StarCraft, you know, we're on StarCraft 5 now and StarCraft 3 was shipped out to some ex Westwood developers and it went back to Blizzard and then it was all right. And then they tried mm. different things with it. No, it's just this mega consistent March getting better and better and better and better. And this feels like the best I mean, five or six missions in, um, plus the prologue campaign they did. So maybe eight missions total. And, um, this feels like the best art single player RTS campaign they've ever made. Um, like you have really interesting decisions to make outside of, of the game. Um, which uh, each StarCraft in, um, iteration has had, StarCraft 2 iteration has done this slightly differently. Um, this time, rather than like, you know, mutating your Zerg in different ways, because you're a Protoss, um, you pick your units are divided into categories. So like melee warrior, ranged warrior, stealth unit, and so on. And whereas in multiplayer, there's a sort of, you know, an orthodox answer for each of them. Ranged is stalkers, melee is zealots. In single player, it lets you pick a different one from like the different sort of factions within the Protoss, like the Dark Templar and the High Templar and stuff. And obviously if you're a StarCraft nerd, you know those differences. But you can change any of those decisions on the fly and it dynamically changes what units are available at what slots in the strategy game you then play in the missions. So you can swap stalkers, which are the sort of standard um, Protoss ranged unit, a very mobile with a teleport ability for a much heavier thing that costs the same. And you can completely change the playstyle of your entire army almost like redesigning an rts faction on the fly by just swapping units in and out huh. of di- different sort of balance positions basically so you get to see like a high templar variant of the dark templar unit which is like the stealth assassin guy um and in addition to that you also invest points that you earn through doing bonus objectives in the missions into um upgrades for your ship which is this sort of like ancient protoss warship you liberate early in the game um and those upgrades go, can, you can spend big chunks of money on powers that are activated on a cooldown in the game itself. So you have a new bar at the top of the screen in single player, which gives you your ship's powers. And they vary from like instantly building a structure somewhere on the map that you can, anywhere you can see, basically, mm. um, to like an orbital strike and different variants on that stuff. I have one that like massively speeds up the production of the buildings. Or you can invest the same points in a more granular way into like, um, uh, like incremental boosts to basically the economic side of the game so like i've played protoss for a long time like uh, my earliest ladder placement was in 2010 and i played protoss that entire time like you, so you, maybe so this is maybe something that feels more impactful or more fun for somebody who knows that game and the army and the systems inside out but it means you can sort of adjust um the exact building speed of certain buildings or start yourself with bonus supply which is how many maximum units you can have and tweak all those values on the fly to match the mission you're about to do which allows you to kind of sort of tinker with like the top level timings, the sort of the, the I guess the sort of, you know, StarCraft is a game about materials and translating materials into forces. And it allows you to, in a really interesting way, sort of skew the 
the, the, the maths, the maths that are so sacrosanct in multiplayer because they have to be absolutely rock solid to fiddle with the maths and pull them in a bunch of different directions to allow yourself to do certain things faster and then change the units that gives you access to on the other panel. And so that in itself in a macro level is mega interesting. And every mission you do, you feel really excited to do because completely story stuff aside and unique mission mechanics completely aside, each mission tells you you'll get this unit and its variants if you to niche this mission and you have the chance through bonus objectives to get up to this amount of extra resources that you can invest in this kind of like evolving kind of, you know, tinkering with, with the game's underlying systems. So that's fucking cool. Um, the missions give you really, like, the ones I've played so far, like, are in the way that they sort of established with the other StarCraft 2 games, you know, very varied. No two missions ask you to do quite the same thing. Um, but they feel like they reward knowledge of the game a bit more than they used to. Like, you have, like, sort of in terms of... I find myself using, like, half legit strategies from multiplayer, like, builds I sort of know, but sort of, like, skewing them and taking advantage of things. And maybe that's simply because this is the Protoss expansion and I've always been a Protoss player, so, you know, where the Zerg want to do what it tell me more. Um, but, like, in that first few missions, I've had these, like, massive last stand sequences where you you can potentially if you if you go quick enough build a huge resource advantage and then basically play tower defense with this endless wave of enemies as you're kind of mixing that with the the orbital strikes and stuff from the ship and trying to balance all that stuff and it'll give you like scaling rewards based on how long you last then you invest back into the ship and so on um and there are like um sort of more standards of exploration things missions where you control just a few small unit of hero characters and stuff and all of it is you know, beautifully presented loads of like bespoke animation for every single mission. If you're destroying, you know, enemy entrenched defenses that only happen to exist for that mission, it will have, you know, beautiful animations like the, you know, the way the buildings in HOTS crumble and construct themselves and stuff. Yeah. And it's like Blizzard obviously have like the, one of the best teams in the world at creating buildings that just like fold and crumple. And like, <laughs> I think maybe creating isometric buildings for so, so long gets you to the point where you're fucking good at it. <laughs> like, hmm. Um, so it looks and feels amazing and um, and the narrative like the plot stuff is obvious like I really like it because it's just big silly space opera guff um, I don't think anyone should make any claim for it being particularly profound but this is also like the big end of the trilogy thing like, it's not only the end of the Starcraft 2 trilogy it's the end of the entire series so Starcraft mm-hmm. 1 and its expansion and the three new games and it's and that fiction has gotten to this huge convoluted very silly point by now but they've obviously just they're, but they're so invested in it and the production values are so high that um, you find it incredibly rewarding. Like, you know how, you know, co- uh, I think maybe the RTS more than any other genre has a history of like really overcompensating in its cinematics for how it looks the rest of the time. Right. So that goes back to Command and Conquer going like, you know, well, we're going to put, we're going to put real Throw Tim actor- Curry at it. Yeah, throw Tim. <laughs> um, whereas this is like, you know, that all the time. And I actually, we spoke on the last episode about whether or not, um, you know, Blizzard were doing the CGI for the Warcraft movie. They're not. It's ILM. So that answers that mm. question. But, you know, what are they doing the rest of the year? Because, you know, maybe you're so used to them putting out like one big cinematic a year or something. The answer is they're making cinematics for StarCraft is, right. is what they're doing the rest of the year. There's <laughs> a lot in that game. and But not like not in the, there's too many of them way, but in a kind of like I just did like the fourth or fifth mission and it ends with a cutscene that would be like the end of a different game. Like the, we're going to throw everything, we're going to throw all the money we have at this kind of ending of a of even a high budget game, and they just throw it at a kind of interstitial cutscene in StarCraft. Hmm. And so the whole thing is this sort of massive feeling of, of spectacle. Like the first time you, when you get taught in the mission that introduces the orbital strike, they can do things with their engine now, like because they do in-engine cutscenes, the engine's good enough to do that. And so it'll do a thing where you 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 so that you know we're giving you access to the guns, sir you know fire when ready and then you fire and then it actually like cuts from the map you're on to space where you see the ship like angle itself and the guns fire and then it actually it manages to do a thing where it almost pulls this off seamlessly where the camera kind of like crash zooms follows the projectiles down into the atmosphere of the planet and then cuts to the rts view as they come like crashing into the thing you've just fired huh. and it looks just convincing enough to be like i've never seen an rts do quite that before right like to do the kind of just like fucking selling it mm-hmm. selling it selling it selling it so i'm dead impressed so far it, it does like it's really made me remember why i love that series so much like you know it's i don't know whether i don't know whether the two and a half thousand hours of dota that i've played in the interim between being shit at starcraft and now still being shit at starcraft (laughs) has made me less shit at starcraft or they've just gotten much like you know but the interface feels like everything feels mega crisp everything that's important to a type of that game like how responsive the mouse controllers and how smart the kind of drag box selection is and those little tiny things that 
probably sounds super boring to bring up. Mm. But everything feels kind of like fucking honed as fuck. <laughs> um, but with that said, it's another StarCraft game. And it's sort of in that situation of, I don't think they've reached too far in kind of delivering new tools to to people. Like I've played, I haven't I tried the co-op stuff yet, but I've played Archon mode, which is their big new idea for getting people into multiplayer in the beta. And I don't think it works, which is in two of you occupying one army, basically. Yeah. Um, I remember Pip describing it as a pantomime horse. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it's it's very hard to distribute responsibility in a way that teaches anybody the game. I think the ultimately, I spoke about, I spoke to them about this at BlizzCon. I did an interview that I probably won't use for anything because that was about to review the game, but, you know, the opportunity to talk to somebody was there, so mm. I to talk to somebody. And it's a thing of, like, trying to ang- trying to edge towards, like, do you have to accept at some point that StarCraft is just very complicated? Mm. And probably, it wasn't originally designed to be very complicated, but the very best players learned that you could bend all its systems to such an extreme degree that you had an incredibly high skill ceiling, and it, yeah, it's still held together at that point. I think that's kind of an accident. Like, I don't think when they designed oh. the original StarCraft, they knew it would not only could be bent as far as it was bent by the first pro players, but that it wouldn't break, right? Like, I think other games might have broken when they got to that point with like 150 APM crazy stuff. But StarCraft just sort of scaled really well. And I don't think it's totally an accident, but I think there's a degree of like, we didn't intend it. But they wouldn't really commit to that. But like, and, and obviously they want to give the message that it's for everybody. Um, whereas I still think like, you know, it's like, this, this is a, fucking difficult game hmm. at the high levels but they've done an amazing job with the campaign like so could far. i play the campaign not having played any starcraft 2 and still enjoy myself that's the other thing it's i think i'm benefiting a lot for having i mean i have not like i've replayed those games recently but i have a you know, memory in my head of what the story is and hmm. it really is space nonsense but it's space nonsense that i've got a little bit of an attachment to because i've invested some time into the series um, I would probably just recommend you play all three. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, I don't know what they offer in terms of like a box set because Legacy of the Void is a standalone game; it's not an expansion. You know, it's right. Um, and they do offer like a, they, they, you know, you, they released before the game came out. They released this prologue called Whispers of Oblivion, which is like a three mission series that sets up the events of the game, and that's available in this, obviously. And and um, at the start of that, you can press a button to like story so far, and it just sort of shows you a video which is like the entire story of starcraft in <laughs> right. two minutes but in doing but it, that probably almost raises more questions than it answers because mm. stuff that maybe is given a little bit of time to bed in is just introduced in like two minutes so like sarah kerrigan she was abandoned she became a zerb but then she's not but then she is okay <laughs> okay and then you're like okay <laughs> and so if you don't know that stuff mm. then it's sort of you know i think you risk sort of missing out like i i, I think if they don't put out a kind of Honestly, if they don't put out like a 40 quid, just play all the StarCraft 2 now thing, right. they'd, that'd be a huge yeah. shame. Because I recommend, I think people should, like I genuinely think it's great. I mean, it's, you know, it's a big, silly, space, violent space Disney movie. But, <laughs> you know, it's, hmm. it is still like, I think it's a more fun fantasy yarn than it has a kind of, I don't know, I just think it's just fun and daft and people say stupid things. And then basically it's, yeah, ignite their arm blades and you're like, yeah. <laughs> the arm blades are different colours now and that's meaningful it is <laughs> speaking of stupid things Marsh <laughs> <laughs> you've been playing a stupid thing haven't you uh, I've been playing um, uh, Black Ops 3 or Black Ops wow. aye 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 if you want to spell it out <laughs> God blobs aye 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 um, which I think is actually really really good but what no <laughs> only kidding I, thought, I was hoping for that response no shit obviously um, I think this this podcast has has a long storied of history of of my opinions on the Call of Duty series, not always expressed coherently, but often quite loudly. Um, but I think in in that infamous podcast, which I now can't remember, that led to the destruction of Tom's laptop, um, <laughs> I actually overstated my case. You know, they say in vino veritas, but um, I, I don't think I was actually truthful about my opinions about blocks. It's easy; it's an easy series to hate, and there's lots of things to hate about it and deride. I, I think I was defending it on that occasion. I think I was... <laughs> we were both drunk. Don't we? It's all right. <laughs> I don't <okay>. remember <laughs> that. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't totally dismiss the series. Like I, I've occasionally enjoyed some of the advancements they've made in multiplayer. Um, I think as a, as a cinematic shooter. There's obviously a lot of talent being wrangled to go towards creating something which is inherently compromised by the systemic pressure of trying to put out something in a very, very short space of time. And they've gone for a particular kind of experience, uh, cinematic experience, which means that uh, it's very difficult for them to account for any kind of dynamism within that, which means that 
all of their games crumble at the kind of if if you kind of push at any of the seams. That's a terrible metaphor. Things don't crumble <laughs> if they've got seams. Anyway, they might subside into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but you know, you can see in these games uh, that they have people who have real skills making them. Like the the facial rigging is amazing in these games, and and the latest one. Uh, it's got some actors from. Uh, uh, I, I'm sure you would know it. It's. I think. Oh, is it Missing Persons Unit? It's some kind of second tier cop show. Law and <laughs> Order Special Victims Unit. It could be. Yeah, it's got the kind of main guy from that ball okay. guy. Anyway, he's he. Uh, he plays your your boss sort of uh, cyborg dude. Anyway, who cares? Uh, <laughs> the, it's it's really good. He looks re- like he's actually emoting with an actual face rather than just a kind of horrible. Is he? Does he? Does he? Does he feel forlorn for he is a sub- cyborg dude? Or he's he's kind of gleeful. Uh, he's, well, he's he's very stoic, uh, but he, there's obviously a bit of glee in his cyborgitude to begin <laughs> with, uh, which then develops in, as the the uh, the drama unfolds. <laughs> uh, but um, so there's a lot. There's there is a lot of skill in in the construction of these things, even if I think the, the results are, are pretty woeful and, you know, it, it's a fucking miracle they make a game at all. It's not a miracle anybody should be thankful for, but it is it is nonetheless a miracle. And this one I felt more kind of uh, optimistic about because they've they've gone full future now. You have, you become a cyborg pretty quickly. Uh, you get fucking torn to shreds by a, a giant robot and then you get refitted with all these cool arms and stuff uh, well not all of them just two actually <laughs> um but your arms are kind of cool and they can do cool things uh, <laughs> so that's that's good i can't remember where i was that's going a lesson now. for life <laughs> appreciate well, your arms i mean uh, my first question is sorry to interrupt um, but yeah, my first it. question is can you do the the cool arm things at any point? Because Advanced Warfare right. was the last Call of Duty game, mm. and it was also future set, and it also gave you a bunch of toys. But the toys could mostly only be used at very prescribed situations. So, for example, they gave you like mm. magnetic hands that you could use to climb up walls. Yeah, but it's and there was there was like three instances in the entire game where you could use it, and it was just a specific wall that hey, this is a painted red wall, so you can climb over. It may as well just have been a door. That you opened, yeah, for all the years. An elaborate QTE, yeah. basically. Um, yes, this game does uh, go further than that, um, and that's that's what I was trying to point with the your arms being ripped <laughs> off. Is that you get a whole slew of different skills um, that you can deploy at will, really at any point in the game, and you can switch between them. They're kind of broadly divided into three categories. You've got like um, a, a kind of pointless group of hacking skills. Uh, you've got a bunch of physical skills like running super fast and punching things real good, and you've got a third set which is called chaos or something like that, which <laughs> allows you to disrupt. But it's easily kind of the the best set because um, it's always applicable. Like you're always either fighting robots or men uh, or women. Actually, there's a huge and this is the this is the biggest advance is that you kill huge numbers of women in the game, <laughs> and you can play as a woman uh, as well. Um, so that's that's good, uh, <laughs> and uh, you can deploy any of these these talents at will. Sorry, I was going to talk about the chaos, wasn't I? Yes. Yeah, so the chaos skills um, they allow you to disrupt things. You've got uh, ability which allows you to um, send out loads of drones, which kind of either bamboozle or set fire to other people. <laughs> uh, you've got a sonic weapon which causes people to puke and shit themselves Do you until they die. Them from bamboozle to set fire, <laughs> like on a dial. Yeah, like, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, like Mean Machine at a Judge Dread. Puking shit themselves to death, you say? Yeah. And uh, you've also got a skill which causes robots to explode. Um, but often you'll be fighting a mixture of robots and, and humans, so you've got to kind of switch back and forth between these these skills to kind of best reduce their force quickly. And the maps are also... I mean, this is the thing they, they sold it on, so you've got this kind of skill set which is fairly broad. It's always available. And you've got these maps which are also pretty broad and they've got a lot of different routes through them, supposedly. Hmm. And um, so all these things sounded like really, really good advances. And I'm sure the person who came up with them was actually not an idiot. Um, (laughs) But the way that they have been massaged into a a game of this kind has essentially misunderstood the purpose of all of them. And one of the most criminal things about it is that it, 
it ruins most of its stuff in service to a progression system, which is what COD has been doing for the last few years with all of its stuff. It's forcing people to kind of grind and then upgrade. And it just means that you don't have the, the interesting stuff to do uh, for the first part of the game. Actually, the opening missions give you loads of tools and then inexplic- inexplicably takes them away. has no kind of contrived reason for why you're upgrading yourself. It's just, it's like, yeah, you did pretty well. Now now you can, you know, you can make people puke. And you're like, oh, <laughs> um, is that like, is that a thing that your armist can do? Like, uh, how are you? It's a sonic you... weapon. So I assume you go, <laughs> I, d- I don't know. The- You've just done it now, Martin. <laughs> You've ruined the podcast. <laughs> Sorry. We'll mop it up afterwards. The, um, I think everyone who listened to this <laughs> so there's a bunch of problems with the way that those powers are implemented and that's evident in in the chaos selection that we just talked about because although making people puke is pretty fun setting them on fire is pretty fun just distracting them is pretty fun you'll notice that all three of those things do exactly the same thing like that's three mm. different skills that they've used and it has exactly the I same say distracting distract- someone is the same as setting them on fire in terms of the effect that it has, yeah, because huh. they are, they are just taken out of combat for a period of time while you shoot them. Oh, so the fire isn't lethal. Um, I think they can recover from fire. I, I don't or know. The, or the distraction is lethal. Well, that's the, the, one the, the two. Yeah, ways. I mean, yeah, you're either going to shoot them dead while they're distracted, or they're going to die of fire, or they're going to shit themselves to death. It's kind of like push, right. push button, go away now button. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and it's the same with the, the robot destruction stuff. Uh, it just doesn't sell it either, which is weird because you think a game of this kind of superficiality would be really good at selling those kind of skills visually. But instead, what happens when you want to destroy a robot is you just hold your hand, your palm up, and then you put it down again. And then, like, five seconds later, it blows up. And you're like, oh. Because robots can't return an awkward wave. <laughs> yeah. and the, the knowledge it's like, destroys you left me them. hanging, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've failed you. <laughs> First Lord of Robotics. Poor, Don't poor leave a robot hanging. <laughs> Yeah, so I, that's that. Sorry, Advanced Warfare had the same problem because it, I think, had a very simple hacking thing that maybe you could mm. use to hack enemy grenades while they were in their pocket. Oh yeah, and it was just push button explode now. Yeah, and it was. I mean, I always find this with Call of Duty games and the grenades. Anyway, like they always give you six or seven different types of grenades. Certainly, Advanced Warfare had that many. You had... I think there's only two in this, actually. Yeah, that's... I, well, actually, maybe I just haven't bothered to unlock them because grenades I find to be extremely boring. Um, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, the the other problem with the, the, the broad range of skills you have is that, as I said, they're split into these three categories. These three categories aren't available to you at any time. You have to pick one category for any mission, uh, which would be... Also kind of okay, it feels a bit stingy. Like, I don't see why the game would be less fun for having all of these tools at your disposal all the time. And eventually, apparently, if you level up high enough, you can actually get all three cyber cores uh, (laughs) that you you can scan between them at will. But even so, all of the abilities that you have are all on the same cooldown, which means that there's no way of chaining any of these abilities in interesting ways. Obviously, I think I'm, I could, I I bet real money. I don't bet real money. I I might bet real money that the original design, the guy who came up with these skills, wanted you to be able to use them in succession. Maybe he didn't even envisage them being on the same button as they are. But like you have this, you have these these kind of physical abilities. You have the ability to run real fast and punch real good. And you can jump into combat and you can do a ground pound, which smashes people out of the way in, the, in a particular radius. Um, I was just going to say, given that that's such a, a thing now, smashing the ground and knocking people away oh, yeah. in a radius, does that work? <laughs> <laughs> you want the Mythbusters episode yeah. where they I don't think pound Can the you ground. punch the ground in such a way that people near you fall over? I don't think, I don't you, think could you could apply can. that amount of force with... In a sorry for not, not with a hand, I, <laughs> no. I imagine. Not even with a robo hand. I don't know. Yeah. You probably just don't have enough mass, do you? No. Even if you're replaced with solid titanium. Anyway, um, those sound cool, don't they? But yes. uh, the problem is getting into combat in any of these scenarios, like they haven't changed any of the way that the enemy AI works. So they just the enemy AI just mills back and forth. Uh, in a way which doesn't either resemble kind of humanity or presents you with any kind of tactical interest. Like, they're completely unreadable. You'll just see these people running running laterally across the map for no reason. And, you know, if you stick your head out of combat, it's the same with every COG game. You get jam-faced until you die. So being in the open is, is bad, right? So you can't really... You can't just waddle out there 
and then ground pound because you're going to die. And if you run out there with your sprint, then you're just going to be left in the middle of battle with, that, with your cooldown coming down. And it will take too long for, for you to recover or long enough for you to have your ground pound. Obviously, what they want you to do is to be mantling off all this kind of stuff and diving into combat and smashing it and farting out your, your smoke powers and then getting out of, out of dodge. But you can't do any of that stuff because it's all on a cooldown. And it's, it's just like they've... I, they've misunderstood the entire purpose of those systems that they've created. There is a cool thing, though, which I th- I think almost works, which is that I think it dynamically shows you on the screen the the kill zones. So depending on where enemies can fire, it highlights the ground in in higher color of like from green to red. I think. Um, so you know if if there's a particular area of the map which is going to be subject to crossfire heavy crossfire because there just happened to be a number of enemies around it'll kind of mark that for you i think that's kind of cool hmm. um but a lot of the other stuff doesn't seem to really work um even the like stuff like marking enemies in the hard seems to work sometimes doesn't seem to work other times even your superpowers like your ability to make people shit and puke themselves or do stuff um that seems to be arbitrarily unavailable for certain kinds of enemies, uh, presumably boss enemies where he wants you to fight. But Guts of steel, those guys. Well, <laughs> but the, the, the problem is that the, the alternative to using those powers is just to hold a button down when you point the cursor at them, and it feels just shit to kind of go back from having any kind of sense of dynamic physical powers to just the whole kind of clicking on men's head until they fall over game, which is what COD has always been. Does it feel like COD pretending to be a better game rather than actually being a better game? Yeah, well, it's got halfway there. Like, you can see the, the, the seeds of a good design there. But, you know, it should have been left to uh, respawn. Mm. Like, Titanfall is just a much, much better game, and it has a lot of the similar sort of systems in it. I imagine Destiny is from what I've seen of videos mm. in yeah. terms of the way that you can chain powers and yeah, yeah, do cool stuff. Game is built around that. In fact, get that game is built around cooldown mitigation as its most interesting kind one of its most interesting features yeah. but this is extremely kind of stop start in the way it applies that stuff Call of Duty always seems to me like it's trying to be a very accessible game it's trying to be a game that people who don't normally play games can play you know mm. FIFA and Call of Duty are the two games that a lot of people play and those are the only games they play and they don't give a shit about games as a medium and they wouldn't they would be a little bit baffled I think by say crisis which just gives you all these superpowers and kind of open areas that allow you to use them underestimating people a bit sometimes but i don't think it's underestimating people to say that they're time poor and they just want to have a exciting experience without you know yeah, I just, without the learning i don't think it's about um i do i do people being stupid i think it's about people not wanting to invest that's a fine argument. I think it just doesn't apply to COD. I think COD really does get by on its marketing and its its the, the awareness of that name now and the fact that people have been buying it for so many years. But I don't think it's... I don't... And obviously you can't say, well, I bet those people who bought it who like it didn't really like it. Obviously that's, <laughs> that's not a stupid thing to say. But I, I think uh, even they would be able to identify things about it which are they would find unsatisfactory. Like every COD player must have at some point just broken something in that game because it breaks all the fucking time. Like as soon as as soon as there's some kind of scripted piece of dialogue, if you're not standing in the right place, the kind of amazingly mo-capped actor that you're with will be turning to a wall and addressing that. And, you're, you know, trying to negotiate exactly where you need to stand so you can give him a leg up because it's it's just really poorly poorly constructed with no kind of flexibility to it. That stuff, that must surely... People who are only aware of games from the perspective of a cinematic experience must find that stuff cinematically unsatisfying in some mm-hmm. way to be able to identif- uh, identify it. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure, okay, so the kind of the finer points of design about how powers combo maybe they aren't aware of, but, like, I also think that maybe if they played more than one or two games a year, then they would recognise how shit COD is in that respect. I'm not saying that they they would play um, Blops 3 and, and mm. like it for that stuff, but I'm wondering if that's why it feels like it's halfway towards a, a good game. It's because mm. uh, w- we want it to go further and give you more freedom with those powers, but they're trying to find a way to integrate those powers without it becoming complicated. Mm. Now, we're trying to find a way to add complexity to 
a very simple formula which they set in stone well either with Call of Duty 1 or with Modern Warfare 1 depending on how you want to look at it um, and how do we keep doing that without it just becoming samey how do we you know not make it topple over and I don't think they've worked out how to mm. do that yet and yeah, I think no, I, I, like, not, the yeah. argument that we were having on that pod when we were very drunk was me saying that I think that Call of Duty is often unfairly compared to stuff like Half-Life when actually I think it should be compared to arcade rail shooters. Mm. It is just a game about mm. popping heads. Um, and the fact that you can move your legs a little bit more than you could in a rail shooter um, doesn't really matter that much. It is just about funneling you from corridor to corridor to corridor. And I think Modern Warfare 3 actually did a really good job of that. I think it... My old complaints with Modern Warfare 1 and 2 was you would come into an area there would be the the faucet at one oh, end yeah. from which military grunts would pour and you wouldn't be able to tell whether is there just a finite amount of them that I have to kill them all yeah. or is there a trigger point halfway across this where I have to pass that and then that will make the faucet switch off whereas Modern Warfare 3 fixed a lot of those scripting problems and that was partly level design them working out how do we make this game and that was after the you know infinity ward imploded and respawn left and stuff like that whereas i actually think modern warfare 3 got it right in a way that blops never did blops one at the very least was a game where you could just walk through it not shooting everyone not shooting anyone sorry and everyone around you would get killed and the scripting was always shite and then advanced warfare didn't work either lots of stuff does explode if you don't shoot at it anyway in this game but not all of it I mean, you are required to participate to at least a small degree see i feel like that argument is giving them a bit of a free pass graham because like like marsh was saying about how uh crypt dark takes a really simple formula of shmup and piles mm. systemic complexity into I, i'm assuming some play the game but like relatively seamlessly into what is minute to minute a fairly straightforward experience i think there are recent examples of um you know linear narrative single player shooters that achieve a COD-like effect as part of a system far more elegantly. Like Wolfenstein The New Order is a really good example of this, how it has the commander system. So if you enter an mm. arena, um, enemies will spawn forever, but the faucet in that instance is an actual character you can kill, and you're told really clearly, like, you're fighting waves and waves of men because you haven't killed the commander yet. If you choose to stealth it, which is an option sustained by the systems of the game, you can kill the commander, kill everybody else, and you don't have to deal with it in that way. But it's still fun to play the other way because the guns are great and the shooting feels nice. Mm. So that is a game you can play like Time Crisis, and it's perfectly satisfactory because you, you get the good shooting and the men come in the right number of waves and then you get to the commander and it's paced very well. So if you play it that way, it's not going to be like a grind to get to the commander. It's just, a, you know, it's technically less efficient than stealthing it. But if you want to experiment with the systems a little bit, and I, I to be honest, I find that people who don't play a lot of games are more likely to push it and to, to not assume game logic in some cases and push it things a little bit differently then it rewards people for doing that rather than the COD thing that Marsh brought up mm. right at the start, which is punishing people for bumping up against the edges of the game even slightly. Like, I think there's a point where that becomes, like, you know, it's possible to say that there's artistry in creating something so finely scripted, but I think there's plenty of other people achieving something similar mm. without, um, without putting people on rails and, and quite the same way right like it's yeah i'm happy I mean, the thing is i'm totally happy with it being uh a light gun game that you move it's just i i, I think it in all the ways that they they facilitate that movement they aren't very adept at it like and i also think that wolfenstein is much better analog for kind of a mass market shooter than i think uh half-life is i agree, I agree that half-life isn't where call of duty would ever aim or hope to be and i i'm totally down with the idea of a, a thoughtless mainstream game where you you know you you kill people <laughs> endlessly that's 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 if you you know if we're accepting of that as a kind of a genre then fine but i just don't think that call of duty is a particularly good exponent of that regardless of its success I don't think it's giving them a free pass to say that with Modern Warfare 3, they did the thing they're trying to do well. Mm. And I feel like a lot of the time the complaints about Call of Duty are, I wish the systems were do allowing me to do things mm. that this game is not about. You know, it's not trying to be a stealth game. Um, I think yeah. it has problems when 
in Blop 3 or Advanced Warfare, it starts trying to be these other things and does them really badly. But mm. in Modern Warfare 3, where it just says, no, we're just about moving really quickly from A and B and clicking on the heads, and it makes that a really smooth and seamless experience, I think that's fine. Mm. But people still get really angry about it because it doesn't have... Oh, you can't toy with the AI, I can't play it in this other way. And that's, mm. you know, fine if that's the kind of game you want, but... Well, let me, give me, let me give you an example of, it just occurred to me of of, uh, of something that I think even even the kind of stupidest players of this game would recognise is not making any sense. You, at one point you're in, I, I think, forget where it is, I think it's Shanghai, it's been submerged, basically, tidal waves are washing in across the, across the city, the, the part of the city that you're in. Um, and it tells you you need to place down this anchoring device whenever a wave comes in. It goes a beep, 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 wave coming in, place your anchoring device down. And you kind of just, you have this weird animation where you, you kind of poke at the ground with a rod and then you, you retra- it's gone, it's retracted. You can ca- carry on moving as well. So it's not clear that you are actually anchored in any way. And also, even if you don't do this, you don't get washed away. So <laughs> it just makes no sense. It's just like this weird kind of strange, glitchy poking animation <laughs> For a system that doesn't actually exist. And you're like, why is that the game? Surely a- anybody who's played this would just be like, what What the fuck is meant to be going on here? What are they even trying to describe with this animation? I think that's what I'm getting at. Like, I don't think it's of... I get that, I get that it's not reasonable to ask COD to be a game, type of game it's not trying to be, as it would be for any other game. But if you're talking about it speaking to a, a, a audience that only plays this game a year then there are, you know, the game systems aren't just, you know, game generic game systems like stealth or whatever. Like, stealth is a concept that actually exists in real life, and it's it's based on what what the player presumes they can do when they look at a scene full of people. And then, you know, if a player looks at a scene full of heavily armed men, and they're humans, and you have a vague sense because you're a human of what humans can see and do, you might assume that you can approach that scene in a different way to how, you know, the game tries to do it. It's like when you see a, 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 somewhere you should be able to climb over in the game you can't, right? Like, a lot of you know, a lot of those, I think those early advancements in the FPS towards things like stealth games happened because people approached it like, well, this is now sort of newly immersive. I feel like I should have more options than the old arcade options of run and gun because I, you know, recognize some intelligence in the people I'm fighting. And it's weird to me if I, if they, ha- they, they do have eyes in their back of their heads and so on. Mm. Like, and so, you know, I think it's more natural actually for people who are less used to FPSs to assume, oh, this is actually just about shooting. Sneaking shouldn't work. Like that that seems like game logic to me rather than Yeah, but I, I think it is game logic. I should stress I'm not defending Black Ops three. I haven't played, I'm sure it's shit. And I thought Advanced Warfare was shit and I've played Black Ops one and two and I thought they were both shit. And I think there's lots that shit about Call of Duty. But I think there is a, a certain thing which they sometimes set out to do that one thing and do that one thing well, but then still get unfairly maligned. And mm. I don't like I think yeah, that is game logic, but it's game logic that in Modern Warfare 3, at least, they communicate really well. And I don't think... I think it gives too little credit to players to think that they don't understand what that game is trying to be. Like, every mission in Modern Warfare 3 is really clear about what your objective is and how it needs to be performed and how you succeed. And the the gaminess of it is sort of embraced to enough of a degree that the, the scripting doesn't become janky you don't bump up against the edges of it too much or you know the classic cod thing of walking to the wrong side of the street and instantly being killed because you walked out of the playable area oh you can still do that yeah. i jumped over a wall and it gave me like half a second <laughs> to get back over it yeah. like, what <laughs> all, all, all of that stuff is is bullshit but it sometimes they communicate that stuff well and it's okay for a game to say you know what we don't want to simulate human experience and Yes, stealth in real life would, of course, be a viable option, but so would dropping out of the military and going and becoming a baker. <laughs> like, you, 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 you understand yeah, that, there are, that there are limits to... I just feel like, isn't this... Like, aren't we kind of lauding them for a creative challenge that's only imposed because they insist on doing one of these a year? Mm. Well, they, well, that's also not entirely true because there's three studios making them, so they oh, do yeah. one every three but years. But still, now, it is still an absurd is, turnaround for a AAA 
you know, full future thing. I just, I, I sometimes disagree with the notion that the kind of ultimate state of the first person shooter is the immersive sim and that all games should yeah, like sure. slide towards this state where you should be able to toy with the AI and play the, the whole thing. The, the why can't we talk to the and, monsters argument? Yeah, that whole thing. Like, do I like is roller cool. coasters though? I don't, I like that. I, you know, I, I'm a big kind of defender of Uncharted because I think it's the pinnacle of that, that kind of, mm. that mm. kind of experiment. And I'd, I'd really like to see. Uh, a, you know, a, a Call of Duty game that they'd spent like they'd got right, they'd worked on until they were happy to release it. You know, rather than being rushed out just before Christmas, because I think that would be it would be really interesting to see. I mean, they might reconcile all of the problems that I have with it in that kind of time period because they clearly do have people on the team who who understand games. It's just mm. that they can't they can't make it work in the in the time mm. they're given. And the reason I brought up Wolfenstein is because it's not an immersive sim. It's just a shooter that has enough going on around mm. the fringes of the simulation to have like a padding. Basically, there's a buffer zone where like if you try and play it like Dishonored or Deus Ex, you'll be disappointed because it's not that robust. It's not, you know, it's not like they've had, you know, shitloads of time put into, you know, tiny little interactions with the environment and stuff. But the idea is that they've created a linear corridor shooter with a about shooting men and being told the story that uh, that extra amount of development time and effort and resource goes into basically like having soft edges of that simulation mm. so that the player that does push a little bit, which I think is natural, like I don't think it's, you know, it's asking too much necessarily to push a little bit, isn't immediately punished for it, which is the classic COD thing of feeling like the moment I decided to even do something slightly original, I was completely told off. Um, you know, I just, I don't feel like, I think, yeah, there's certainly artistry in what they do or skill at least, mm. but I don't, I still don't kind of agree that it's like good for you. You knew what you were making because it's like, I don't know, like the player shouldn't be asked to bear the kind of economic and production constraints of the product. No, but it's that roller coasters are fun. Sometimes it's not like, uh, Oh, you should forgive it because of the constraints it was made under. It's that if you do that thing, well, that can be fun on its own terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, from a, a, a buggy, extremely narrowly focused game to uh, a very <laughs> buggy, but much broader focused game. <laughs> so I've played... Uh, have you guys played Fallout 4 yet? No, no. I haven't. Okay, so I I need have. to delete like eight games from my hard drive. Or yeah, space uh, luckily the entire Batman series is installed, so <laughs> gone <laughs> instantly. Um, well, Call, Call of Duties is like 56 gigabytes or Jesus, something like that. It's bigger than Fallout. Yeah, yeah, almost twice as large as Fallout. Fuck me sideways. That doesn't make any sense. Oh. Um, that's what all those faces take up. There's lots yeah. of faces. Um, but I have I played the the first uh, couple of hours twice now. I had some time last week with a um, admittedly a PS4 version of the game. I'm going to switch over to PC to play it properly, but enough time to get a feel of it. And I think if we'd spoken about it then, as indeed we did, I probably would have had a quite a different opinion of it. I'm, I'm more willing to reserve a bit of judgment now because I read um, Phil's Silver Savages review for, hmm. for PCG, which sort of acknowledged the thing that I definitely feel, which is that I didn't really feel it in those first couple of hours. Um, and he, he he's really super into it. My experience at the beginning of Fallout 4 was kind of weird because, I mean, I, I loved Fallout 3. I played it to death and then I loved Skyrim and I played that to death. And there, was, there felt like a big paradigm shift between each of those games in terms of the scale of the world. And even though fundamentally they're kind of the same game in some ways, like they felt really different. I'd never seen a big fucking dragon thing sweep in and do all that stuff when Skyrim came out. And Skyrim had this huge vertical dimension that seemed really new and fresh. And so even though I had gotten tired of Fallout, I was ready for Skyrim and to do a lot of the same things again, go on that journey again. However, within like three hours of starting Fallout 4, I felt tired again like i was tired at the end of my time with fallout 3 like it hadn't changed enough in that short span of time and i think a few things compound this um without spoiling anything in the first couple of hours of that game it gives you basically a sample platter of everything that's in fallout it feels like it does some story stuff it does some shooting stuff it allows you to do some crafting stuff if you want it does a sort of linear bit and then, you know, it gives you a suit of power armor to play with and a big monster to kill like within an hour and a half like and it, it, it does some things to take away some of that stuff or mitigate the use of that stuff immediately afterwards. But in a way, it felt like, you know, oh, I really hope it, you know, is it continues to escalate from here or something because otherwise this sort of feels like I've, I've done the arc of a Fallout game in terms of my power, <laughs> like straight away. Um, and like, and, and you and I sort of, and, and Tom Francis saw a bit of it after that fact, right? Like where it was sort of, 
um you know that the sort of the the wandering the wasteland encountering vignettes and picking your side and then either shooting one person or shooting another person or shooting both <laughs> and that kind of thing and that formula having felt quite reduced by time and familiarity but I think what that comes down to actually and this is the sort of thing I'm going to adjust, adjust going back to it on PC and actually one of the main reasons I'm switching to it on PC is it feels like that's a game that has prioritized its systems and deepening and polishing all of the little things that make up a Fallout game rather than becoming more immersive necessarily or more about like living a life in another world which is kind of the alternate thing right people everyone plays like i mean the, the the paradigm here is me versus tom francis like how he plays skyrim and how i play skyrim how i play skyrim is tell myself a story of of someone's life in a kind of fantasy world that is reactive but i'm ultimately buying into mm. whereas tom traditionally plays those games in order to break them and you know kind of see what he can make the systems do and i'm really interested when hopefully when if tom's on next week like what he thinks of fallout 4 because i suspect it's more his type of thing than mine hmm. because i felt like the you know the escalation of those initial few minutes didn't make any sense you're given a really strong narrative impetus to go and do one specific thing then immediately distracted you are um your power level particularly if you play as you know one of the potential f- protagonists because you you basically create a husband and wife at the start and then pick which one you're going to play which is a nice idea uh, it's established that the husband's been in the army. So some of the absurd kind of like crazy combat stuff you do in, in the intro, I mean, it's established that it's the husband who was in the army. The wife was a lawyer. Makes sort of narrative flows narratively if you play as the guy, but is a bit sort of sudden and out of nowhere if you're trying to invest in it seriously playing as, as the wife, which is potentially a more interesting story, right? Mm-hmm. Like you play the version where it's it's not the, the soldier dude that gets to be the hero, it's his his partner who's a trained lawyer but has never maybe lifted a gun in their life that that is interesting but the game does nothing to you know what i mean it's like no power armor jump off a rooftop with a gatling gun go right <laughs> like um you know and that's that stuff bothers me and i think took me out of the experience in a big way um early on but by all accounts and purposes and it's totally derailed the, knowing that it gets better and knowing that it focuses on the systems in a super interesting way and the people getting a huge amount of that makes me a bit less willing to kind of well, it makes me more willing to try it again but less willing to sort of voice all the ways that I was slightly put off it I guess in those mm. in those in those first few hours um, although now I'm just you know I'm just going to go and play as whoever the fuck and call my name my first handcrafted gun Mr. Gun and walk around that you know cartoon world shooting people with Mr. Gun because it feels like that's right. the game it actually is mm. which is a bit of a shame for me because it's not really what I wanted but it feels yeah. like you know hung on a long enough timeline all game series go the way of Saints Row a little bit mm. like they all it, games tend to trend towards silliness anyway and at a certain point that becomes responsive with the developers where the developers start embracing that silliness more and start seeing, Hey, people like these kinds of mods and, you know, buying into that a little bit. Like, uh, Alec did our review at RPS and the, the number of clothing options in that <laughs> game and the silliness of those clothing options is it's not as far as central gives you, but it's a little bit of an element of that. And if what you're in it for is, not the systems of Fallout 3, but the fantasy of surviving in a wasteland. It seems like it's very congruous a lot of the time. I think, I think the thing that could redeem it for me and that may still happen is some better writing. Like, it's very formulaic when it starts. And... Might be waiting for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, like, but you know, New Vegas had, you know... It, actually, mm. what was interesting is I think it reminds me of New Vegas, <laughs> which I wasn't necessarily expecting. Like, New Vegas had that problem of, like, living in its sibling's shadow and being like oh it's this again but the writing's a little bit better in some ways and it's a bit janky and it's a bit flat you know kind of thing the voice acting didn't seem as bad as previous Bethesda games in the short clip I saw but it might have just been those characters it's mega inconsistent yeah. like you can early on you meet like a group of survivors basically who you're friendly with and you meet them and in the space of that group of people there's one person who's convincing one person who's like 80% cartoon character and one person's like 120% cartoon character <laughs> mm. and if, the, if it, uh, they haven't done the Bethesda thing of hiring an all star cast which is nice oh yeah um, so it's not like one of them's a cartoon character and also like inexplicably 
Malcolm McDowell. <laughs> like very, very quiet Malcolm yeah, McDowell. Yeah, yeah, quiet, far away Malcolm McDowell. But, um, but yeah, it still feels like they've not quite solved their storytelling problems, despite opting for like a Mass Effect style. Mm. So it's like that game is completely encapsulated for me so far in my early experience with it. And I stress, I created it again. I started again on PS4 because I, I didn't like the character I had and wanted to try it a different way. Um, and then um, I'm going to play it again and try it again on, on PC maybe tonight. Um, but um, like they've recorded, it's, they, you know, they're famous for doing this. Maybe, maybe it was worth it for them simply from the press it's gotten for recording so many real names that if you enter certain names when you create a character, your, your household robot knows what to call you. Only that character in the entire game, but he will say Christopher, I've established. And it is kind of cool. And it was weird how natural <laughs> that feels straight away, having played so many games that find ways not to call you the name you've entered. That's worth 45 quid. But they didn't need to do that. <laughs> they didn't need to do that. And there's loads of instances of like, mm. that's sort of the game for me. It's like loads of like little things that are like cool. Like, they, they, you know, the, the interface is, is, is better in a lot of ways. The, the diversity of radio stations, the, the crafting mm. detail of that, the fact that you can make these little towns that have like systemic AI, the fact that the NPCs appear to have conversations to each other about things that have happened to them in the story kind of naturally and organically um all that stuff is like great you know bethesda haven't done that before and i can see why they might regard it as their, their best game on that basis but it doesn't have that kind of immediate you haven't done this before thing mm. and um, and because particularly because it's ambitious those little ambitious advancements on the formula they've made are all matched by weird jankiness <laughs> so like the first time i stayed in a town that had sort of grown up around my character populated by individuals who would go and talk to each other about stuff that you know replace the oblivion system of like hello hello have you heard about <laughs> trees no, I hate that, and I hate you. <laughs> Goodbye, then. And then they walk apart forever. Um, like, different place that was more from an organic system, but I got into town, and I could hear two of them happening at exactly the same time, overlapping each other yeah. in a way that sounded completely dissonant and unnatural. And then I turned around, and my dog was doing a handstand. <laughs> <laughs> Bethesda. Yeah. <laughs> Fallout 4. And then, you know, the credits open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bethesda this never is, changes. I see uh, I, I... For many years, I, I really like Bethesda's games, but I, I, I think it's always been diminishing returns because those games have got larger, but not uh, not better at executing the things they put in those worlds. And so you you end up with a huge amount of content, which is all executed to a level of mediocrity, which is just slightly jarring uh, to to very jarring. And I don't know, I, I you know people. People, I remember the kind of the the press run for for Skyrim and, and for Fallout Three before it, and they were like, "Yeah, you can do this hundreds of hours. You've got all these characters. You can go and see all these places. You can go and explore. And exploring those games is exciting. And except, and up until the point when you realise that the only things you can do in those places are either the same things you did in other places or broken. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't. The magic of those worlds kind of depletes pretty much instantly when you get a certain threshold. And it's been shorter and shorter the period of time b before I hit that threshold with each Bethesda game. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I played Oblivion for hundreds of hours. Then uh, I played Fallout for 100 hours. I played Skyrim for 30 hours. And, like, I, I don't know how long I'm going to play Fallout 4, but I, it's telling that I'm more excited to play Tomb Raider than I am Fallout Oof. 4. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The, yeah. It's got really good reviews. Yeah, it has. I, I walked past someone playing Fallout 4, uh, sorry, playing Tomb Raider during the review process and saw its FIFA Ultimate Team style microtransaction card system. Ah. And I was almost sick in my mouth. Uh, actually, and that's maybe, somebody who wasn't. Maybe that. I'll just kill myself instead of playing <laughs> any other games. I think that's um, where this is going. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, it feels like uh, I think had, um, had the reviews not come out and, and, and sort of both acknowledged the way I currently feel about it and moved past it, I probably would have been a bit more dismissive of Fallout 4. I'm kind of waiting now for the next episode of the podcast mm. where somebody comes on with a brilliant story about something really silly they did and it'll all make sense mm. and it'll all click into place and I'll, I'll, and I'll want to play it. So I'm not going to sort of write it off totally. But, but yeah, I don't, I don't think those... I think those first few hours, don't A, don't open particularly strongly and B, it's interesting. That, that diminishing returns mm. thing is, is real in a way that I didn't think it was. Shall but, we do questions from questions? Yeah. Why not? Eurist writes, Dear Amphora and Club, <laughs> two MMO-based questiony questions of question S. <laughs> Number one, do you have thoughts on the new standalone version of Warm Online? Will the ability to change the skill rate gains and make the game less of a grind fest make you want to play it again or try it for the first time? Number two, 
I remember Star Wars Galaxy being talked about a lot, but I don't remember the SWG emulator project being mentioned. Have any of you guys tried it? Do you plan to? Or is it preferable that SWG remain, remains the wonderful set of memories that it has been since it shut down? Thanks for reading, everybody. So I, this is kind of interesting because this is like, what, like one question about the MMO that Graham loved and one question about the MMO that I loved. So Nothing you first. for poor Marty. <laughs> Nothing for Martin. Uh, it doesn't make me want to go back to it, I'm afraid. Um, making it less of a grind fest is probably a good thing but the reason i liked that game was for the sense of community it generated um when you would team up with other players to raise a barn sometimes explicitly raise a barn um sometimes build a house sometimes cut down a bunch of trees sometimes plant a bunch of trees sometimes dig a main all of these things because they were so difficult to do on your own such a grind to do on your own they made you work together with your fellow players and I worry that if you can fudge with the levels, you're only ever really going to make that stuff easier. There would be no point making it harder, certainly. Um, and you might lose a little bit of that community feeling that made that game so special. While it never, you know, compensating for that by feeling tactile and nice. Like, it's never going to be Minecraft or fun to play on your own or anything like that. So, hmm. Every time I write or talk about Star Wars Galaxies which is all of the time um, <laughs> I do get like a whole bunch of really well meaning messages obviously that are just like have you tried the emulator come and try the emulator it's in a better state than it's ever been we've just got space working or something like that I haven't tried it and and partly that's time to time but also it's partly because as much as I love that game and lament its dank, dank decline it's also associated with a very specific time and group of people like I was part of a role playing server um, that has its own wiki, right, to keep track of all of the the stories that took place on that server. Not all of them brilliant, but whatever, right? It's about the people who were there at the time all invested in something that was equally accessible to everybody, whereas a kind of half-complete work-in-progress mm. emulator simply isn't that. And I feel like, I mean, and it, it may well be that there are role-playing communities sprouting up on the emulator, which is great. But for me, that feels a bit like hoping for that, feels a little bit like hoping that, if I moved back to my university town, I could have my university life again. Mm. I don't know. Like there are shades of the midlife crisis to it. Like I just need to move on and accept that, you know what I mean? That I'm not, that, that I had my kind of Star Wars role playing experience and I have lots of feelings about it and thoughts about why it was a great game. But I don't necessarily aspire to have it again. Hmm. Because That's broadly true for me in Warm Online as well. And yeah, this, this whole thing always feels a little bit like trying to clone your dead pet and hoping it turns out the same way the second time yeah much like the new star Wa star wars film will be presumably your attempt to meddle with my feelings have failed Mark. <laughs> <laughs> still excited and there's nothing you can do about it <laughs> <laughs> echo nolan writes question for the podcast i've been playing arc a lot recently and it's reminded me of an extra credits episode about the responsibility of games designers me and my friends have a lot of dinosaurs, probably 40-ish, <laughs> and they all require feeding. Berries have to be gathered and meat has to be hunted and cooked. Then all of it has to be placed in three different feeding, feeding troughs. It takes an hour or two to do all of it. If we have pressing out-of-game obligations or just want to do other things, it's possible all our dinos will die. Do designers have a res responsibility to avoid stuff like this? Is it necessary for certain types of games? Well... I just spoke about Worm Online and the effect that it has on teamwork when you do have high demands on players like that. But in this particular instance, it doesn't sound like the responsibility is on the designers. It sounds like the responsibility is on the dinosaur owners. Mm. And perhaps you shouldn't have got 40 dinosaurs if you didn't have time to feed them all. <laughs> dinosaurs are for life. <laughs> Not just for a few weeks. Not just for the... <laughs> I don't know, the early access period of your survival game. <laughs> Not just for Dinosaur Christmas. Which is in November. <laughs> yeah. 
Seven proxies writes, I was recently playing Wonderful 101 when I noticed something. There were healing items in the game. I have multiple playthroughs on this game yet have never once used a healing item or even thought about using them as they decrease your grade at the end of the mission. I was wondering if you have ever noticed any completely self-imposed challenge in your gaming habits, for example, refusing to heal during an RPG. Does grading the player implicitly state that any grade less than absolutely perfect is a personal failure, a sign of moral weakness? I don't really understand the last sentence. It doesn't entirely make sense. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, maybe no. (laughs) Well, there's certainly, like, I mean, whenever I play a stealth game and stuff like that, I'm pretty determined not to be spotted like i play when i play metal gear solid uh on my own i tend to restart missions as as soon as Mm. i'm spotted that's a self-imposed pointless uh punishment upon myself which probably actually reduces my enjoyment of the game overall and yet i do it mindlessly and and, uh compulsively anyway so i just um i was thinking about this because i just finished the banner saga which is i know is like a kind of a bit several years ago probably Mm. but um i played the bulk of the banner saga on my ipad um like last christmas and i played it in a way with the self-imposed rule because i slightly misunderstood what type of game it was and i assumed you could lose more characters mm. permanently plot wise in those fight sequences in the sort of turn-based combat sequences oh, than you actually can yeah so i had a meticulous system of reloading my save in order to kind of ace every combat encounter with everybody alive which i think actually made me quite good at those combat encounters mm. But I didn't realize that there's actually a whole system in that game based on injuries where if your characters fall in combat, they're injured for a certain amount of days, which is, you know, mitigates how your mm. next fight might go. And actually, the game was a really good system. You know, it, it, you know, you don't want to lose people because you'll, you know, you'll, they'll be out for a few days and that might affect the next battle you get into. But, you know, you it's also not going to completely punish you for sometimes a big tough enemy wanders over the, the wrong person and smacks them and they're dead. So... I had a real, real grind with it, and I kind of burnt out on it. Um, like, after a really tough bit, I, I put it down. I didn't pick it up again until I was on a plane coming back from BlizzCon. I was like, you know what? I'm going to pick this up and just see if I still like it, because I feel like I should have finished it. And it turned out I'd quit, like, half an hour from the end of the game. Huh. So I just picked it up, played, like, two battles, and finished it. And because I was like, oh, I think this is the end, I was like, I'm just going to finish it. And then I realized, oh, when people fall, they don't actually die. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I was at that point, I'd, I'd come to terms with people dying. So, like, oh, this feels like the end of the story. I, I'll just remove my thing about pointlessly trying to get everyone through it and just play it. And it turns out just playing it works a lot better than piling on self imposed kind of decisions. Like, I did the exact same thing with Bioshock. I hate, I, for me, we talked about this in a previous episode when we were talking about games that explain death in an interesting mm. way. But for me, when I first played Bioshock 1, the Vita Chambers felt like a narrative contrivance too far because how would they work? You're a stranger to this environment how would they know your genetics they got all this effort this is me ignoring a future plot point not really getting what's coming um how would they you know they put all this effort in to explain that these vita chambers instantly revive you are tied to a particular genetic signature there's no way you could have that so it's just game design bullshit that you're allowed to revive from them (laughs) so i loaded to save every single time i died huh and by shot one because it didn't make narrative sense and then i got to the point where you find out that it does make narrative sense and I felt like a right twat. <laughs> <laughs> so that's both times, basically. I met someone once who was who kind of gave up on Bioshock one because they were furious at the start of the game, where uh, your character finds a plasmid and just like almost immediately just jabs it straight into their arm and <laughs> right. injects the magic inside of them. And at that point, they were like, "What? What the fuck did you do that for? What? What human being would do that?" And of course, it's explained at the very end of the game but you can't say that to someone because that's a spoiler so you're trying to like no you should go with keep it. playing it it's this so might be good. the ultimate problem with like games that make a clever point about player agency is a lot yeah. of people be like i didn't fucking do that because actually it's not it's two different people as character and there's the player and yeah mm-hmm. like how pictus writes Share your wisdom. I came late to Mass Effect, having only played any one within the last year. I love it so much. It scratches my heroic SF itch like nothing else I've played. I want to go on with the series, but the negative press surrounding ME3 has me worried that playing all the way to the end will ruin it for me. Chris, 
Fellow Mass Effect fanboy, should I play on and finish the series, or quit while I'm ahead and bask in the glow of Mass Effect 1? This is a guy who's asking a question, he knows what kind of answer he's going to get, and <laughs> uh, wants that a, answer. A, a lady, actually, based on the email address. Oh, is it? But right. because a handle was given, I thought we'd read out the handle rather than the name. Keep crowbarring open those crates. Like on Pictus. So I can do this super quickly. Yes. They should keep playing. <laughs> yeah. No, um, you, you should absolutely keep playing. The, the the internet kerfuffle over the ending was overstated, to say the least. There were some complaints, and they were legitimate, and they were addressed in the extended cut version of the ending and some of the DLC surrounding it. Um, you should absolutely play it. The ending's really good, actually, with the extended cut, I think. One of the better game endings, generally. Um, particularly, if you're, particularly, I think, if you're doing a run where you can play the entire series back-to-back and you can kind of see those themes evolve. Um, if you get to the end and you decide that it is all bullshit and you are willing to stage a consumer revolt over it, then uh, I'm 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 really sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. Yeah, no, I think you'll like it. All right. What do you think, Barty? Uh, I haven't I haven't finished it. So you never right. finished Mass Effect Three? No. Remember, we went to the pub and we drunkenly had a big long talk in which you explained the ending to me, and oh, I was yeah. like, "Oh, that sounds fine." <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do remember angry that. About that. Yeah, that great. That, that, yeah. So your version of the end of Mass Effect Three was me drunkenly explaining to you. I tell you what, if you get to the end of Mass Effect Three and you're worried about it, I'll record a separate thing where I drunkenly explain the ending of Mass Effect Three, <laughs> and you can listen to that instead, and you'll think it's brilliant because I think it's brilliant, and I enthusiasm for it which is not Stockholm Syndrome shut up <laughs> <laughs> will shine through and that's all the time for questions that we have today if you'd like to send us a question of your own you can do so by emailing us to questions at Crate and Crowbar dot com <laughs> by tweeting us at Crate and Crowbar by leaving them on our forum Crate and Crowbar dot com forward slash forum if you would like to support the podcast in other ways, you can do so by backing us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash crate and crowbar. Or you can join us in the Discord chat room, <laughs> a place where I will not be, but maybe you two guys are sometimes. Yes, I am. All the yeah. time. Every day. Every, Every day. day it loads on startup and I can't figure out how to get it to not do that. <laughs> <laughs> there is a link in the show notes if you want to hang out with cool guys, Marsh and Chris, and other people. Yeah, the other people on it are probably cooler than us, yeah. I would say. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> or you can follow us and tweet to us. As individuals, I am at Gonas, G-O-N-N-A-S. I'm at Marsh Davis, which is D-A-V-I-E-S. I'm at C. Thurston, that's C-T-H-U-R-S-T-E-N. Don't phone it in this week, Chris. I'm not going to. Thanks for 